Hey everybody, it's Mom to Wife One. Thank you so much for clicking on this video, for coming to my channel. If this is your first time here, hey, I'm a content creator, I'm a mommy, I'm a wife, and as you can see from the title below, I also like to review and recap Married at First Sight. So this will be my last season doing so. So if you are curious about the show, never watched it, or if you watch past seasons, feel free to go to my channel look at the playlist that says Married at First Sight Reviews and Recaps, and feel free to look at me talking about this show from at least the past two or three seasons. I will say this, I'm thinking about other content to put on my channel. I like to watch a lot of different documentaries. I'm getting into shows that people have recommended to me, and it's like, oh, maybe I should talk about this. There are also a lot of books that I like to read, so I haven't quite figured out what that content is going to look like yet. I was thinking about giving my recommendations for like some of the best music documentaries I've watched. So let me know if you guys are interested in recommendations or do you prefer for me to just do reviews and recaps? You know, comment below and let me know. So <clears throat> before we get started, I'm not going to jinx myself and say that I'm coming down with something. Especially don't want to say it too loud because my husband is nearby and if he even hears me hint at me not feeling well, he'll be me and tell me, oh, you need to take medicine, you need to do this, you need this. I ain't got time for all that. I'm okay. Throat's just a little dry, so there may be times where you see me stopping to drink a little bit of water just because my throat is dry and I'm coughing because I'll be talking a lot. Regardless, before I get started, please make sure you like this video, make sure you share the video, comment, subscribe to my channel. Married at First Sight, Season 17, Episode 12, maybe? I take notes every week, so I know it probably looks like especially the past few weeks that I'm not prepared. I actually take very rigorous notes, but I actually like this format better where I just kind of talk about what I saw from memory and what my feelings were and whatnot. So they are more than halfway through this experiment and, you know, everything's pretty much falling apart. It's really just a big old mess. You know, I'm not going to recap what happened to some of the past couples. I will say I was very happy that we didn't see Lauren and Ryan this episode because we have literally no reason to see them again until decision day when everybody gets together to talk about what they've learned from this experience and blah, blah, blah. So I'm just really glad I didn't have to see them, which is great. Cameron and Claire are moved out. They're living in their own spaces, but we find out that Cameron has a heart condition, which is obviously really sad. And Claire is feeling some type of way. She's feeling guilt because she's like, I don't know if the stress from my marriage led to it or made it worse. And so she's trying to be there for him, which I think is a really interesting situation to be in, right? Obviously, neither of them signed up to get divorced. That's not why they signed up for this experiment. That's not why they answered like 200 questions on a questionnaire. They signed up to be married to someone. And the marriage didn't necessarily work out, but it doesn't seem like there's any hatred or animosity between the two. It's just a matter of, okay, I can't give you what you need. You can't give me what I need. And that's just kind of how it is. And I'm sorry it didn't work out. So because there's no animosity there, they still talk, I don't know how often, but Claire is just kind of torn, I guess, in terms of how much help she should be giving Cameron. She wants to be there for him. You know, she obviously is worried about him and his health. And he's like, oh, don't worry about me. I don't want you to put that on yourself. Like, he's still being typical Cam, just like, you know, not wanting her to be upset and making sure she's good and all that stuff. But she's like, but he doesn't have his family here. They're all the way, I believe, in the Netherlands where his family's from. He has some family type friends here, but she has this big old family. So like Dr. Pierre called her and was like, well, maybe what you can do since you have a strong support system through your family and your friends, maybe you can talk to Cameron, see if he's comfortable with you. It also made it seem like the idea was to loan her family to him, or I guess just kind of, maybe not loan is the right word, but offer her family as part of his support. So that way he's not going through this whole thing alone. Um, so they didn't really show her having that conversation with him. They only showed Cameron once. Like he was like, I'm really trying to get my heart rate down. Cause apparently if my heart rate is over a hundred, then that's dangerous territory. So he's like, I haven't been talking to the experts. I've barely been talking to Claire. Like I haven't really been talking to anybody. I haven't left the house. I'm just trying to like focus on getting my heart rate down. And we see a preview from next week's episode, well, this week's episode that he's going to have to have some type of heart surgery. So it's looking really scary for him. And like I said, for Claire, she's in kind of a weird position because it's like, we're still t legally married, but we're getting a divorce at some point. So how much should I be invested in this? And at the end of the day, she still cares about him and cares for him. So it's kind of an interesting situation. There. And obviously, I hope that Cameron is okay and that the situation isn't a deadly situation and that he'll be able to get it taken care of and, you know, that everything will work out all right. We'll go, we'll save Michael for last. 
Emily and Brennan, there is no hope whatsoever. <laughs> the fact that Dr. Pepper sat down with both of them, and the thing is they're, oh gosh, Brennan had the idea of, you know, let's just do a reset. And reset is such a weird word, I think, for an experiment that's only lasted five weeks at this point, and you only have three more weeks to go. So you're resetting to what exactly? And they met with Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper was like, you know, was as confused as I was. And it's funny because Dr. Pepper before used to be better at having a like a poker face. Now Dr. Pepper like shows her frustration or shows her annoyance a lot more than she used to in like season like one or two. So she's just looking like. Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, that's what you were, all right, that's not what we would like, but okay. And so Brennan is basically like, you know, reset, meaning that, you know, we're going to go back to, hi, I'm Brennan. Hi, you're Emily, just kind of getting to know each other because marriage, basically, this is my interpretation of what Brennan is saying. Marriage is harder than I thought it would be, so I need to pretend like I'm not married anymore and go back to the idea that I'm dating this person. Maybe if I act like I'm dating her as opposed to act like I'm a husband, I won't be as stressed and I can just kind of focus on getting to know Emily. If you just wanted to date somebody, you should not have signed up for this show. That's point blank and that's period. This show was never called Dating at First Sight. It was never called like Matchmaker at First Sight. Let's just meet somebody you might hang with. The whole premise, as you well know, Brennan, is to sign up for the show to get married. Being married means that you are a husband. That also means you have a wife. There are a lot of things that come along with that that I'm sure he probably didn't realize. And there's also this matter of them being on camera. Because he made this comment... Um, Dr. Pepper gave them the ex the fishbowl question, which is interesting because normally in other seasons, every couple has gotten the fishbowls. The fishbowl is a, a literal fishbowl just full of questions to help build intimacy, just talking about really deep things like when were you last disappointed? What is something you regret doing? You know, just really good questions to help you really learn the character of the person that you're married to. And this is the first time they've actually broken out the fishbowl for real, like for all the couples. Um, all, it's only two couples. But they're in the hot tub answering these questions. And I forgot what one of the questions was, but basically he didn't want to answer because it was going to make him, it was going to paint him in a quote unquote negative light. And you could see the back of his head and you see Emily's expression. And he basically says, no, nah, I'm not going to say that because that's, you know, that's not good for camera or something like that. It's like, so, and I think that's very indicative period of how he's been treating this marriage thus far is that he seems to be very careful about what he says and doesn't say because he doesn't want to come off as a certain way on camera. And it's like, yes, the editing that they do on the show sometimes is a little bit on the shady side, but they don't add things that are not already there. They don't put words in people's mouth that they didn't actually say. So you censoring yourself for the cameras means that you're not being honest and true with us which you don't necessarily owe us anything but that also means you're not being honest and true with emily because yes you know the cameras are a lot to get used to it's an adjustment for everybody but again you signed up for a television show so you signed up not only to be married not only to be somebody's husband but to also have it televised to the world for however many weeks and yes, it is a lot to really come to grips with, but that's why a lot of people take the time to do some soul searching before they sign up for the show in the first place. So you, again, knew what you were signing up for, and now you find yourself not up to the task of being the kind of husband that Emily deserves, not up to the task of working on a marriage and making it work, and also apparently not up to the task of having cameras in your face and saying something that could, posit that could possibly make you look bad. And even the question that was asked, it wasn't like, you know, when's the last time you shot somebody? It was a, some kind of question like, you know, what is something you regret? Or what is a decision you made that, you know, you wish you had done it differently? It's like, that doesn't make you look bad. That makes you look honest. Everybody has those kind of, everybody can answer that question or something they wish you could have done differently. It doesn't have to do with a relationship. It could be something with your job. It could be anything. And obviously he had an answer in mind. If he was able to say right away, oh, well, I don't make myself look bad. It's like, come on, dog. Like, you signed up for the show for a reason, and now you're not being honest with your wife about whatever it is that you're hiding from her. So none of that makes any sense. And Emily is increasingly getting frustrated with Brennan. 
Before, she just kind of went along with whatever he said and she kind of make little faces. Now she speaks up a lot more and is like, I know that you feel that way, but you don't understand how it's making me feel that I'm not getting a direct answer from you. And you're saying this and you're saying that. Da, da, da. And he gets frustrated because in his mind, she's being disrespectful. And it's like, you've driven her to this point now where she's just fed up with you. Because honestly, she wasn't like this in the very beginning. She was a lot more patient and a lot more understanding, at least trying to be. But now it's gotten to the point where I've been patient with you for all these weeks. There's literally no improvement. We are still not kissing. We are still not hugging. We are still not touching. I still don't know the crux of your character because you're still either hiding that side of yourself or you don't know how to tap into that side of yourself. And again, you also refuse to go to therapy to figure out why you can't tap into that side of yourself. So now I'm just stuck. And now I'm pissed off because I'm not getting what the heck I asked for. And you keep telling everybody, oh, we're taking it one day at a time. That's not good enough for her anymore. And she's getting frustrated, as she should. So we're seeing that crumble, not even slowly, but surely. It's been crumbling every single week, like literally. So that's them. And last couple is Austin and Becca. They had a good time. Uh, I always love when the couples get to see their spouses in their environment, in their work environment, in their environment with their friends. It's always kind of cool because they do get to see a, a different side of that person. Because who you are in the office is not always who you are when you are home. It's not always who you are when you're out with your friends. It's not always who you are when you're at a library, whatever. Sometimes you change excuse me, your personality to match the environment. And for Becca, though, she is naturally just very bubbly and friendly. And she's a wedding photographer, so she's used to really being upbeat and, you know, just capturing the beauty of these wonderful moments. And so she took Brent into her studio, and he had some of his friends drop by, two of his friends that have two beautiful little kids. And she kind of coached Brennan through taking pictures of these kids. And he was so impressed with her. He's like, she's not only good at her job, but she's really, really good with kids and Oh my gosh, she's going to make such a great mother one day. And I remember someone saying in the comments, because uh, I read a lot of the comments that people, and just tweets or X, whatever they're called. I read a lot of stuff people say about the show every week. And some people are incredibly hilarious and creative in their responses. But one person did say, how's Brendan going to look at her like, oh, you're going to be a great mom one day, but yet you still ain't have sex with her. It's like, you know, that's a very valid point. Because we still don't necessarily know what that's about. He just keeps saying like, oh, I'm going to take it slow. And, you know, I just want to take my time. It's like, if you guys weren't on this show, now, mind you, I'm going to assume, I don't know Brennan from a can of paint. I'm going to assume this to be true. If you were just dating somebody, if you met them, dating them, you got serious, within five weeks, you probably would have already had sex with them. Honestly, especially someone that you see every single day, like you see Becca, someone that you sleep in the bed with every single night since you met her. So you mean to tell me you sleep in the same bed as this woman for the past... Five weeks is what, 35 days? And you haven't had sex with her once in 35 days of constantly seeing her, consecutively seeing her every single day? I don't understand what that's about. And I feel like we haven't gotten a real answer. He just keeps saying, you know, I just want to take it slow. I want to take my time. But at some point, and I think we see Becca, they show like a future episode where she's saying, you know, I don't know if he's even attracted to me because that's doing something for me that I'm sleeping in bed with you every single night and you're not touching me. So what am I supposed to think? We are great in every other area. Everything else is looking fine and great and dandy. We kiss all the time. We hold hands like we're touchy. All of that is there. But then when it gets to the bedroom, nothing's happening. So that is a really, it's a really interesting thing. And I feel like they don't talk about it enough. It only really comes up when they meet with the experts. And it's always Becca bringing it up, obviously, because she's like, I'm ready to get down with the get down. And we ain't doing that. And I don't know why. So I don't know what's happening there. I think it's really strange. And I'm hoping that they'll delve more into it this week so we can really figure out why they haven't done the do. Or for all we know, maybe they have done the do and they're just not telling us. I don't really think so. I think they haven't done anything at all. I just don't. Now we'll get to Michael. Michael, who originally was stood up at the altar. Well, not stood up because technically the woman came down the aisle. But since she came down the aisle, she said, I don't want to get married. This ain't for me, blah, blah, blah. They have found him a replacement wife, a woman named Chloe, who seems incredibly sweet. 
She seems very eager to get married. She seems very eager to be in a situation where she's able to let go, let somebody else make the decision for her because she's always made the decisions for herself. She's always been a perfectionist and she's trying to, she's in her season of not trying to control everything. And because everything else in her life has been successful, has been accomplished, all of her goals, dreams, or whatever, she's like, I'm ready to be a wife. This is what I've always wanted. And I'm in a place now where it's like, I'm ready. Like, let me do this. So, you know, I don't have any ill will towards her. I don't know nothing about the girl for the most part. But I was like, oh, okay. She seems nice. She's excited. Dr. Pepper made it a point not to tell her that Michael had been set up at the altar. And at first, I wrote a note like, why would she tell her that? But then she explained. And I was like, okay, kind of makes sense. She was like, I don't want to tell her that up front because I don't want Chloe to second guess whether this is really the person for her just because his first time around wasn't successful. I don't want her getting in her own head and then talking her own self out of doing, out of going through with it or having that looming over her head when she's married to him and kind of, you know, falling back on that. Like, oh, well, maybe this isn't working because I wasn't the one meant for him and he wasn't the one meant for me. And it's like, no, I want, him, I want her to go in with a clean, blank slate, still full of hope, still full of enthusiasm. Now, the question is, is Michael going to tell her? I feel like Michael seems like a very honest person. So I feel like he is going to be the one to like tell her. I would imagine he would tell her probably the wedding day. He doesn't seem like a person that's going to like hold stuff back. And we see a clip of him from next week when he's asking all of the couples, not even all the couples. He's asking Becca and Austin and Brennan and Emily. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if he's reaching out to Lauren and Orion and Cameron and Claire. I'm very curious if he's going to reach out to literally the whole, all of them. Because I don't know how often he talks to these people. But there's a scene where he basically goes to them and tells them, hey, um, they found a new match where I'm getting married on Saturday. I would love for you guys to come. So they're going to be there like standing up I for him. Okay. So... It's going to be, I don't know if the wedding's going to take place this week. I really hope it does. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Give me a whole episode just on Michael and Chloe. They've lost so much time that I feel like it would be good to focus just on them for an entire episode. We don't need to see Lauren and Ryan again. I don't need them ever again. Cameron, show him really quick doing some health updates. That's fine. I guess you got to show Claire if you show Cameron. That's fine. Brendan, Brendan, I don't even know dude's name. Brendan, Emily. Austin and Becca, show them at the wedding and then show, you know, some awkwardness between them at the wedding. That's perfectly fine. Then have the rest of the episode, if the episode is an hour and a half, dedicate 45 to 50 minutes just to Michael and Chloe. Focus on them getting dressed, focus on them getting married, focus on their conversation after the wedding, focus on them. And that's the other question. Are they going on honeymoon? Because they're getting married five weeks after the other couples did. So I'm curious about this timeline. Are they going to get to go on a honeymoon, right? A. B, are they going to get the chance to live together? C, are they going to make all the other couples stay married a little longer so that Michael can kind of catch up and then they do the decision day for everybody at the same time? Or will they have the decision day for all the other couples as planned, but Michael and Chloe get to live together for their actual eight weeks and then they have their own decision day by themselves? And if that happens, does that mean that that's going to stretch the show out and make the show go instead of it um, running for 16 weeks? That means we want to get an extra three or four weeks because we've got to see Michael and Chloe. I don't know what any of this stuff means. I have a lot of questions. I have no idea how they're going to figure this out. I'm very, very curious how they're going to line up that time. Because it wouldn't be fair at all to have Michael and Chloe have their decision day after only two and a half weeks of marriage. That makes no sense. So, I don't know. I'm very curious. I, I ask a lot of questions clearly. But it's like, I, I want to know what's going to happen. Like, this never happened in Married at First Sight history ever. So, I don't know. But that's basically what happened the last episode. Cameron, I do hope that he's feeling better. I think that he and Claire are just meant to be friends. And that's really unfortunate. But, you know, I, again, I don't really see any hope for them. Lauren and Orion, go your separate ways. Don't ever talk to each other again. And hopefully, guys, hopefully Orion finds somebody in his community because I think that's what he needs. And hopefully Lauren will find someone that can respect her, that will love her. That will be as understanding of her as I know she plans to be to them. I think Becca and Austin, I still have a tiny, tiny, minor, minor, minor molecule of hope for them. Because they're the only couple that I actually at least see the connection. And I see that they're trying. I see they really want this. So I really want them to make it work. Like, I really, really do. Emily and Brennan. Emily, you know what? I'll apologize. 
because when they announced who was going to be on this season when we first met everybody, I had no expectations for Emily at all because she had never been in a relationship because she was so young. And yes, there are moments where she's a little on the immature side, but I think a lot of times when we see that side of her, it's because Brennan is bringing that side of her out. It's not because naturally she's this immature person or whatever. So I'll apologize to Emily because I thought for sure she's going to be the issue and she's not. It's him. It's completely 100% Brennan. I want her, well, she's getting to a place now she's speaking up a lot more. So I do appreciate that. But in a, she keeps telling her friend and telling other people, you know, I see something there because, you know, things were great at the wedding and things were great at the beginning of the honeymoon. So I know that things can be great again. And it's like, okay, things were great. That means things were only great realistically for about five days of your marriage. And then since then, everything else has been going downhill steadily every single day since then. That's not a lot to go on. Five days of it being great compared to 30 days straight of it not being great like that's though that doesn't balance out at all so i want her to fight for herself i want her to advocate for her own happiness i know she has hope that things can turn around but again and i've said this before you cannot fight for a marriage by yourself and brennan is not giving me any indication that he's willing to actually put real work towards anything because even when they talked to dr pepper and dr pepper was asking about the whole reset thing and you know what needs to change all the things he mentioned that needs to be changed are things that he believes emily is doing it's like he still doesn't think that he's done anything wrong he didn't mention at all like well i need to open up more it was like well you know i think you know one thing that needs to be established you know respecting each other's boundaries so if one of us asks for space for instance you know the other one doesn't get upset they just understand oh, okay space is needed okay cool and that's all he mentioned it's like you act like a that is kind of a okay asking for space in general is not a bad thing but when you are married, asking for space does not mean going back to your apartment and just living there or moving out, for lack of a better term, and just physically being away from me. If my husband says, hey, I'm going through a lot right now, or I'm not happy with you right now, I need some space. Space for us would mean, okay, you're in the living room, I'm in the bedroom. That means I'm not going to come bother you. I'm not going to make you talk about this thing right here and right now. You need time to kind of process what's going on. That's fine. That is what space is. And when you are married and living together, that means I'm not going to be in your personal space. You won't be in mine. We're going to have that that space. And I'm not going to talk to you during that time because I don't want to alter whatever's happening in your head. That's what that is. Not, I'm going to go back to my apartment. No, when you are married, we are. this is your house. And again, that's why for a lot of times married at first sight, and I've been saying this for years, when they put them up in these apartments, they purposely give them a two-bedroom apartment. So if you do need space or if something's going on, hey, there's another bedroom right there. You go to the other bedroom, not sleep in there, but go to the bedroom just for a few hours. Hang out, play video games, do whatever you need to do to kind of get your mind at ease. That is your space because we are married. We're going to stay in this apartment even though I'm not in your face. Go to the other bedroom for a few hours. Then when you come out, be prepared to talk to me about it or change your attitude. That's what that is. So it made me upset, really upset that Brendan kind of put all of the, without really saying it, he really was putting all the blame on Emily and basically making it seem like she needs to do all this work. So that's why we're going to do a reset because, you know, she's not really doing what she needs to do. You are not a bowl of peaches, sir. You are not doing what you need to do at all as the husband. And Emily is always, she doesn't speak up in those moments when they're with the experts. Sometimes she does, but there's a lot of stuff she kind of keeps under wraps. And I really want her to be like, okay, that's true. But also during the reset, I need someone to understand that, you know, space doesn't always mean physically leaving the apartment and going to your own apartment. I think that's something that needs to be established. And then also it would be nice if, you know, one of us, was better at communicating and really saying how they feel and stop running away when things seem hard because that's not what marriage is either. Because it's like, especially the way I am, I'm petty. If you Are we going to be passive aggressive? I can be passive aggressive with you. Don't tempt me. I will go down there with you and be passive aggressive and we'll talk about you like you're not there. If we're going to do that, boom, let's do that. Maybe Emily's a better person than me. Maybe she is, maybe she isn't. But I do wish she would just say a little bit more about what she needs in the moment. And then also, before I cut this off, Dr. Pepper asked him, and this was the first time, I really appreciate this. This was the first time that one of the experts asked him outright, 
tell me five things that you like about your wife. This man was stumbling. He could only name two, maybe three. She asked the same question to Emily. Emily immediately rattled off five things. That's a problem. That you can't, after all these weeks of being married to this woman, you can't name five things that you like about her. And who knows, maybe there aren't five things you like about her. Then have that be something that you say, as opposed to stumbling and like, oh, well, uh, you know. Uh, and even the stuff you said was like, oh, she's fun. You know, she comes up with fun things for us to do. Whatever he said, it wasn't anything. The things that he listed weren't things about her personality necessarily. It was things that she does probably primarily for him. But it wasn't like, oh, she is very nurturing. She is very considerate. Um, she's nice. She's a very hard worker. She seems like she's a really good friend. Like nothing. And it's like, do you know this woman at all? And that's proof positive to at least everybody watching that you haven't gotten the chance to really know who this woman is. You're focused on what she's doing for you. You're focused on the fact that you're not physically attracted to her. And that's pretty much it. You're not focused on what you can do to be the best husband that she needs. Because that hasn't crossed your mind at all. You're not thinking at all about the kind of husband that you're being to her. You're not thinking at all about the kind of husband that she even needs you to be. None of that has crossed his mind. None of that is his priority. So Brennan can kick rocks. They're not staying together. I need Emily to break it off now. Move for decision day. Girl, you don't need to hang on for what? Everybody else jump ship. You actually have legitimate reason to jump ship. Jump ship, girl. Save yourself now. Save yourself. And that's pretty much it from Herod at First Sight. Season 17, episode, like I said, 12, 85. I don't know. Regardless... I'll be back here sometime next week to review and recap the next episode. Comment below. If you guys are still watching, even if you're not still watching, let me know what, let me know. I don't even know what to ask because I, again, I don't have hope for any of these couples at all. Um, maybe Michael and Chloe. I really want to see what happens. I'm very curious to see what takes place with them. But I will say, let me know for you. Who is the biggest villain of this season? And who is the one person, not couple, because like I said none of these couples are necessarily great, but who's the one person that you're really rooting for to have a good life post Married at First Sight? Comment below. Again, make sure you like this video, share it, subscribe to my channel, and I will talk to you guys next week. Peace.